brings you the plain truth about today's world news and the prophecies of the world tomorrow. Well, greetings, friends. This is Herbert W. Armstrong with the good news of the world tomorrow. Now, we've just been seeing that there are millions of people today, just like those of a little over 1,900 years ago, who believe on Jesus Christ, and yet they don't believe Christ at all. They don't believe Jesus Christ, but they do believe on Christ. They've heard the Scripture quoted, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. So they think that's all there is to it. Now we saw here in the 8th chapter of John, during the very ministry of Jesus, that as he spake these words, many believed on him. That was verse 30. In the next verse, verse 31, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, Now, these were those that believed on Jesus Christ and were not saved. These were those that believed on Jesus Christ but didn't do the things that he said. These were the ones who believed on Jesus Christ and who worshipped Jesus Christ in vain. As he himself said, in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the precepts of men. And making God's law of no effect by your human traditions, your human ideas and ways. The way to come to God through Jesus Christ is to forsake your way and your thoughts, and then accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, and come and find God in God's ways, and believe Jesus, and the things that Jesus said, and the gospel that he proclaimed, and then you're on the way toward salvation. But the way you're hearing it today, that there are no works, and that uh, all you have to do is to have an empty faith by believing on him, and go do as you please, and follow the crowd... You're following the broad and the popular way that's so alluring, so attractive. Broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be that go in thereat. That's the way the many are going. Well, now Jesus said to those that believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. Now, if you don't continue in his word, which means do the things he said, the things he spoke, and he said he didn't speak of himself, the Father that sent him gave him a commandment what he should say and what he should speak. And if, there's that great big little two-letter word, if, I-F, the biggest little two-letter word in all the English language, if ye do, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. A lot of people today think they don't need to continue in his word, but they believe on him just like these Jews did. And he said, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And he wasn't through yet. Here's part of the same sentence. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now, everyone can't know the truth, and we've been seeing that. It is only those that do the will of the Father. Jesus said, He shall know the doctrine. Those who will do the will of God the Father, they shall know the doctrine. And then you read in the Old Testament in the 111th Psalm that a good understanding have all they that do his commandments. Well, these people were not free, and Jesus said they were not free. They said that they didn't serve any man. He said, you're the servants of sin, and you're the slaves of sin. He didn't say they were the servants of a man. They were the servants of something a great deal worse. He said, I speak that which I have seen of my father, and you do that which you have seen of your father. Today they say there's no doing whatsoever. Well, there is doing, my friends, one way or the other. You're either doing right or you're doing wrong. You're either doing righteousness, which is the commandments of God and obedience to God, and recognizing the authority of God and the Word of God, the Bible, or you're doing the way of the world and of your own thinking and of the carnal human nature. You're doing either way. It's just a case of which way are you doing. Are you doing the way that is evil, the way of human nature, the way of the sway of the devil, the way of this world, the way of customs and of the society of this world? Are you conformed to this world, going along with the crowd, or are you doing the way of God, which is the way that Jesus lived, setting us an example? He said, you do. Yes, they did. They believed on him, and they did something, but he said, you do that which you have seen with your father. Well, they said Abraham was their father. Jesus denied that. Then they said God was their father. Jesus said, if God were your father, you would love me because I proceeded forth and came from God. He sent me. Then he told them the truth. You are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father you will do. Oh, they were doers. 
But they weren't doers of the law of God. They were doers of the lusts of the devil. They were doers of the murders and the thefts and the adulteries and the lies of the devil. You are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father you will do. Now, he was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth. There wasn't any truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. He was a murderer. He was a liar. He lusted. He broke the commands of God, in other words, and you're doing the way of him. Now, my friends, that's the way all of you have been doing, unless you have really forsaken your way and turned to God and received the Spirit of God and come to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. But I want to tell you it's more than just believing on Christ. Then he said, because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. They didn't believe him. Now, Jesus said that. Then said Jesus to those which believed on him, verse 31 and verse 45, because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. He said that to those that believed on him, but they didn't believe him. Now, in verse 51, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. My friends, why don't we read our Bibles? Why do we believe exactly the opposite today of that which Jesus taught? God is the only power. God has and wields and sustains and directs and controls all power. The people today don't seem to think God has any power, or if he ever did have, they seem to think he's lost it. And they don't fear God today, and they don't realize that the Bible is the inspired Word of God, his message to us by which he speaks to us and that that Bible carries authority. They don't tremble before the Word of God. They treat it carelessly. And where the Bible makes a statement, which is God making that statement, men say, no, I don't believe that. It doesn't mean what it says. Where the Bible says the wages of sin is death. Well, death doesn't mean death. Death means separation from God. So that they can twist it around to mean exactly the opposite. Instead of meaning death, it means eternal life. Just the opposite of death, eternal life in a hell fire which they have imagined, and which you can't find depicted any place in the Bible. That is what people are doing today. You and I were born in a world like that, and we've grown up in that world. Well, this was all on the day after the Feast of Tabernacles and the Temple. And so, finally, Jesus concealed himself when they tried to kill him. These same people tried to kill him that claimed that they believed on him, and they said they were the children of Abraham, they said they were the children of God. Jesus said they're the children of the devil, and they were the children of Adam, not of Abraham and of God. They tried to kill him. They had lust, and they were liars, and they were murderers. Jesus said so. And yet they believed on him. My friends, how about you? You know, the Word of God is a spiritual mirror. Are you looking into it? Does it reflect anything? Look down deep in your own heart and your own soul. God's looking there. You may conceal it from your neighbors. You may have a lot of skeletons in your closet your neighbors don't see. Maybe you can lock up that closet from your neighbors. Maybe you can lock up some things in the secret recesses of your mind and your heart from your wife, your children, your parents, your neighbors. You can't lock them up from God. You're looking into that spiritual mirror of God, His Word and His law. What does it tell you? Does it show you any dirt on your own heart? You know, you can't do away with the law of God. The law of God isn't going to remit your sins. Because by the law of God comes the knowledge of sin. It's God's spiritual mirror that reflects whether it's there. But if the law of God shows you the dirt that's on your heart and in your mind, you need the blood of Christ to wash it away so that you can come under God's grace. Well, Jesus escaped. His time hadn't come yet, and so they couldn't take him. He made his way out of the temple. Now, verse 9, as he passed along, he saw a man that had been blind from birth. Now, in the King James translation, in the English, it says this. His disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now, that implies that uh, he was born blind because they were sinners. And Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned, nor his parents. Now, the way that's translated, it would indicate that neither this man had ever committed any kind of sin of, of any nature whatsoever, nor his parents. And that is not the meaning as John intended it in the Greek language in which he wrote it. The Moffat translation makes it plainer, where it is worded this way. 
They said, Rabbi, for whose sin, for his own or his parents, was he born blind? And Jesus replied, Neither for his own sin nor his parents. Now, you see, he had sinned, and so had his parents. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But this blindness didn't come as a result of any sin they had committed. That was not the reason for the blindness. Now, let me just tell you this. Very often our physical infirmities or such a handicap or an impairment as blindness or deafness or being lame or crippled, very often these things come as a result of sin. Let me explain what sin is. The Bible definition of sin in 1 John 3, 4 is that sin is the transgression of the law. Now, spiritually, sin is the transgression of the spiritual law. Paul is talking of that law in the seventh chapter of Romans, and there he said that the law is spiritual. That's because he's talking about a law that is spiritual, a spiritual law. But there are also physical laws that God created. God is the creator of all laws that move and have being and exist. Now, the laws of God, I've explained this so many times, the laws of God are not just arbitrary ideas put on paper. When your state legislature passes a law, or when Congress down in Washington, D.C., passes a law, that's merely some idea of men written down on paper. And other men have to get the same idea in their minds and have a police department or someone like that and watch people and go out and, through human activity, try to enforce those laws. The laws otherwise don't mean a thing. Now, a law of God is like the law of gravity. That's one of God's laws. The law that makes water run downhill, for instance, and the, the law that forces everything to drop down to the ground unless something... Uh, supports it or pushes against the law of gravity by holding it up or something of that sort. And so the laws of God, my friends, are moving. The laws of God are real. The laws of God are active, and they are forces, and they are energies. They are powers. And God is the power who thought them all out, who designed them, who planned them, who produced them, who produced all force and energy, and who set them in motion, and he is the one who sustains them, and he guides and controls them, and by them he rules the universe. Now, you know, human beings don't seem to realize today that God rules even over this world or the universe or anything else. And the reason is because God is working out a purpose here below, and in order to work out his purpose, it is necessary that God leave us free to use our minds which he has devised and invented and produced and created and given to us to use our minds independently of him to either obey him or reject him. Now, you can't find any other creature in God's creation that you know, that you can see, that you can become conscious of by any normal processes that has a mind like the human man. And that, more than anything else, is the way that man is made in the image of God. Of course, God is described as having hair, and God is described as having a face. He has eyes, nose, mouth, ears. God has hands. He has feet, and so on. And man is in the image of God all the way around. But man is in the image of God in another way. And I intend to bring you a program, one of the Sunday programs, sometime soon on that very thing just how man is in the image of God. And man is more nearly linked, now get this, man is more closely linked to God than he is to the animals. Because man can change and be changed by the power of God and transferred or transplanted from this animal kingdom into the God kingdom. But he can't be changed into a dumb, inanimate animal. He can't go from the human to a regular animal family, but he can go from the human family to the God family. And there is a missing link, and most people have never found it, and certainly our scientists have never found it, and there is no link between man and the other animals, absolutely no link, except that to conform to God's purpose and to bring out his purpose, it was necessary that God make man of the same material of which an animal is made, and that man have the same kind of temporary existence in this life as an animal. Now, some animals live perhaps uh, 12 to 24 hours. I don't know, some of these gnats are 
uh, buds that you'll see in the summertime around in the Middle West. You see them fluttering around lights tonight, and they're all dropped dead on the sidewalk tomorrow morning. And uh, there are some that live perhaps one or two years, and some animals that live a hundred years, and some live longer than that. I've seen old, uh, uh, let me see, crocodiles and uh, uh, so on that are quite a lot more than a hundred years old, they claim, down in Florida. Well, the length of life may differ, but the kind of life is the same. And according to the Bible, we all have the same breath, and we all die the same death. Well, that has to do only with composition and chemical existence. But animals don't have minds like men. Animals can't think and plan and design and initiate and produce. They can't make decisions like men. They can't reason and come to a decision and exercise will and volition like man. Man can do that like God. And man is the only creature in all creation that has that faculty like God. Man, in other words, has some of the creative power. And to some extent, we can create. Because creating is devising a new idea and producing it. And while we can't create the material of which a thing is produced, we can create the idea and change existing material and make things and build things according to our own ideas. Now, man's mind was made incomplete. Man was given certain powers, but only an, an infinitesimal fraction of the powers of God. And God had great wisdom in that. And there was a reason. Now then, man was made to have an absolute constant relationship with God so he could draw on the excess power that he lacks that he can receive from God. The, the strength and extra wisdom and understanding to, to guide his mind that he wasn't given at birth and wasn't created in Adam and Eve. And God made man so that man needs God, and he needs extra things that God will give him on certain condition, and from, let's say, from day to day, or from year to year, and things that are not inherent in the man that he has to receive from God. Now, God's purpose is to make us like himself. And in order to do that, God is character. God is the supreme character, the supreme mind. And in order that character can come to us, it's something that has to be developed. It isn't anything that God, even God, could create instantaneously. Because character is that power of an independent entity that is independent in itself. To think, to receive knowledge, and to reason with that knowledge, and to come to right knowledge, and to make a right decision, and to determine the right from the wrong and to determine to do the right and to have the will and the volition to enforce that right on himself. And in order to make us like God, God even put a nature in us that pulls the other way, like the power of gravity. It's a pull on us. And there is something in impulse and in desire that is innate and inherent within us, each one of us, causing us to want to do the wrong thing. So that there is both good and evil in human nature. Now, there's good in human nature, too but there is also the evil. And that pull of evil, we must resist. And our mind sit as an arbiter, as an umpire over and above the pulls of both good and evil. God will reveal the good if we want it. But man makes his own decision and must make his own decision, or the plan, the very purpose of God, could never be carried out. And so it was necessary, in order that man develop into what? God intended, the supreme character that can be first begotten and then born into the very family of God and become a part of the very God family, the God kingdom, the kingdom of God, it was necessary that man be left to make his decisions independent. If God forced his will on us, if God, well, he, it would be just like the, for instance, like God has set the planets up in the sky. They can't think. They can't do a thing about it. They go around precisely on time. And that moon travels around the earth on exactly the precise time. I don't know the exact number of days and minutes and seconds, but it's uh, approximately 29 and a half days. And the earth itself is inanimate, and it travels around the sun once a year. It hasn't anything to say about it. It can't decide, I, I don't want to go in this orbit. I'd rather go up and travel around some other sun, or I'd rather travel twice as fast, or I'm getting tired of going so fast, I'd like to slow down a bit. The earth hasn't anything to say about it, and the earth hasn't any character. There is more character in your mind 
or possibilities of character, let me say. I don't know how much you've developed. But there is certainly more possibility of character in your mind than there is in Jupiter and in Venus and in Mars and all of the planets in our solar system put together. I'm speaking of the planets themselves that are inanimate and that have to do just whatever God set them to do. Now, that's just an automaton that can't have any personality, that can't have any character, but God is supreme personality. Incidentally, God gave us personalities to develop, and they ought to be developed. And that is ability and power of expression and of influence. And we should develop it for right influence. We ought to develop those things. Well, in order to make all that possible, my friends, it was necessary that God reveal himself to the human families. He did to our first parents, Adam and Eve, and give them their choice to accept the intervention of God and to come to God voluntarily for knowledge and for direction and for wisdom and for excess power that they lack and for all of the things that they don't have and for guidance or to reject that and lean to their own understanding and their own ideas and their own guidance according to this evil pull of human nature, of lusts and of, of the inordinate desires and impulses to do things that are wrong, and they're wrong simply because they're just like a boomerang. They're going to crack right back at us. You know, there are a lot of things that give us pleasure tonight. Pleasing sensations. God created the sensual system of nerves in our bodies, and they give us certain feelings or uh, of sight or of taste or a smell or feeling or whatever it may be that can be pleasurable and can also be painful. All pain comes from the nervous system and uh, all these pleasurable uh, sensations. Well, there are many pleasurable sensations that you can enjoy temporarily tonight, but they're going to give you a terrible headache tomorrow. Now, those things are evil. But the things that are good are the things that give you pleasurable sensations, let us say, I was going to say anticipations, but you get the realization. And then that are upbuilding and uplifting and beneficial, that benefit others, that benefit you. There are like one cigarette says that uh, uh, if you believe it, best for me and best for you. Well, uh, you know, you know what they do? They take things like that. And they take the very slogans of the very thing that belong to God and misappropriate it and apply it to their products. You know, the thing that's best for me and best for you, the thing you ought to walk a mile for, and the thing that is right for you and good for you and enjoyable are the ways of God, the law of God. The people don't want that. No, they want these things that destroy them. They want these things that dissipate and tear them down. And that's why they're evil. Now, things aren't evil because they're good for you and because God wants you to suffer and therefore God is full of vanity like the little imaginary God of Herbert Spencer. He never knew anything about the true God. But the God of Herbert Spencer that he pictured was a God that was so vain and so egotistical that he was lower than any human being could become and that he got pleasure out of our unhappiness and our suffering and denies us everything good and that the law of God is bad for us. Now, the law of God is the way of good for every one of us. It's God's greatest blessing for us. Well, there we are. And so, anyway, God had to make us free moral agents. And he had to make it possible for man to so completely reject God that God is just out of the picture. Now, God has set aside 6,000 years to permit that exact process. 6,000 years for humanity to have free reign and to write its lessons in its own experience. And man has been doing that for 6,000 years. Look at the results. We've been writing it the wrong way. We've been defying God. Mankind has turned away from the law of God. He's turned to his own ways under the sway of Satan. He can't see the devil any more than he can see God, but he likes to obey the devil. And so he has followed the way of lust and the way of murders and the way of thefts. It's all vanity, vanity, vanity. And even greed is only a means of satisfying vanity. And all, as the wisest man who ever lived, was inspired by God to write. All is vanity. The book of Ecclesiastes, following the book of Proverbs in your Bible. All is vanity. And human beings have come to the place, they, it seems that we just don't have good understanding anymore. Our minds have become perverted. We've been born into such a world. And this world has rejected God, and as a result, 
Our sins have separated between us and God, and the world does not know God. And so the world seems to think that God has gone way off, that God has lost his power, and that God is impotent. Listen, my friends, God rules this world, and it is a part of God's rule that he allows this world to cut itself off from him. He allows this world to get so far from him that the world doesn't even know God and that God doesn't seem real anymore. Let me tell you, God is more real than anything that does seem real to you. The things that seem real to you are all going to rot and decay, and they aren't going to last very long, but God will be here forever. And God created everything that you see and know. Now, Jesus replied that it wasn't because of any sin of this man's parents. And I started to say that there are sins that are physical sins as well as spiritual. And when you commit a physical sin, you bring unhappiness or suffering or sickness or disease or something like that on yourself. Now, every sickness and disease is not the direct cause of a sin that we have committed ourselves. Actually, this blindness was a result of sin. But Jesus didn't say it wasn't a result of sin, did he? Jesus replied, neither for his own sin nor for his parents. You know, it might have been inherited from way back or for some other reason. But it was to let the work of God be illustrated in him. While daylight lasts, we must be busy with the work of him who sent me. Night comes, the night is coming, when no man can do any work. My friends, God is allowing it to be day still when we can still get out the precious gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the gospel that God sent by him. That's the gospel that you hear proclaimed on this broadcast. And my friends, it still can go out. And Jesus said, it must go to all the world for a witness unto all nations. Because of the importance of this subject and other related topics, we are pleased to offer the following free literature. What is the true gospel? This free booklet helps you understand one of the most divisive questions of our time. We live in a world of many different religions. While teaching peace and harmony among men, their people are led to war against one another. Witness the long-standing Hindu-Muslim conflict, the Jew-Arab crisis, and the Protestant-Catholic confrontation in Northern Ireland all believing they have the true religion. Ironic, isn't it? With over 400 denominations in the Western Christian world, haven't you ever wondered which one is right? Who teaches what Jesus taught? This free booklet helps you understand that message in the light of today's world. What is the true gospel? Your copy is free. There's no charge or follow-up. What is the true...